back to the topic of um, why music uh, or the question of why music is able to induce such rich emotions in listeners is one that's really fascinated psychologists and neuroscientists for a long time. In fact, it's fascinated philosophers for even longer. Um, um, in fact, there isn't any one strict definition of emotion in, this, in psychology. It's a bit of a, a bugbear. Um, but um, most researchers agree that it basically um, involves a number of key components. So it involves a so-called um, cognitive component, which is to do with you evaluating a situation, a context, an event. Um, there's a psychophysiological component, which is basically um, talking about the fact that your autonomic nervous system may show changes as a result of being in this emotional state. So your heart rate may change, your breathing rate may change, so your um, automatic nervous system. Um, and there's meant to be a sort of expressive, behavioral, I've kind of packing them together, component where, you know, if you're scared, you'll sh you know, your face will show terror. If you're angry, you'll similarly have a very distinctive um, expression on your face. Um, and like I said, behavior. So you might also, you know, you know, act in a certain way in certain emotional states. So there's this idea that, you know, you express and you behave in a, it affects, it shows you that you're in an emotional state. And finally, there's a, the feeling component. And this is probably what we, most of us in everyday life, you know, think about when we think about emotion. It's like, I feel sad, or it's the subjective report, the subjective experience of uh, the person experiencing an emotion. What we know is that emotions include all of these components. What we then mean by music induced emotions are um, emotional states that are induced by you know listening to music and which necessarily have a few of these components. We emphasize the induced because we want to emphasize the fact that it's felt in response to music as opposed to um, uh, perceived, uh, as opposed to us perceiving something in the music. And this is an important distinction to make because often we'll maybe perceive a music as uh, happy, but it doesn't necessarily make us happy. And so this is an important distinction, important distinction to make and one that um, researchers really care about when they look at music-induced emotions. Why would we want to study them? Well, because um, research suggests actually that about half of our music listening episodes involve some sort of emotion. So one could argue that if you, you want to get a holistic understanding of um, emotions in general, it's useful to sort of get a grip or at least better understand this part of our emotional lives. Um, so when considering music-induced emotions, it's important to also consider how psychologists have, you know, talked about emotions in general. So there are two very popular models, and it's almost um, naughty to repeat it because it's the sort of the one the psychologists repeat every single time. It's probably not news to anyone who cares a little bit about psychology, but basically it's the basic model, which is just basically that we have these innate universal emotions um, that you, yeah, happiness, sadness, anger, disgust, fear, surprise. And the idea is that across, you know, um, the world, you'll see people be able to recognize the emotions. This is what makes them so um, universal and basic. Um, but the question is, how well can they actually um, account for music-induced emotions? So maybe sometimes you feel happy when you listen to music. It makes you, or if you feel sad, somehow you feel a bit more yeah, sad. But how often do you feel angry or disgusted? Not often. So the question is whether that would be a good way to think about music-induced emotions. Probably not. Um, or not alone. Um, another very key model is the, that of the dimensional model of emotions. And that simply says, two to three dimensions are enough to describe most emotion states. So the one dimension is valence, which is basically how pleasant, you know, something is, how, how it feels. Um, and then there's arousal, and it could be tension and energy or just, just plain arousal. But the idea is it sort of is an indication of your sort of the state of your autonomic nervous system again, how, um, uh, yeah, heart rate, breathing rate, that sort of thing. Uh, but again, we could say, well, yes, that could, you know, help me tell you about how I feel about the music right now. I feel it's very nice. I feel quite, you know, calm as opposed to, you know, aroused. But again, how much nuance is that in terms of describing what happens when we listen to music? And so what researchers of, in, of music um, psychology have decided is that these are interesting and useful, but not enough. And the trend has been to try to um, see if we can capture or um, acknowledge the, the wide variety of emotions that may be induced by music and really emphasize the fact that perhaps they aren't the sort of utilitarian emotions that we experience in everyday life. Now, t t utilitarian emotions are meant to be those emotions that help us adapt or adjust to events that are important to our survival and well-being. You know, fear, you have to run away from, you know, the thing that's fearful. Um, 
often there's no real critical consequences of what we're hearing when we're listening to music. Um, basically, it's just the form that we're enjoying and reflecting on. And so the idea is that actually with um, music-induced emotions, we're basically, these are specific emotions that are of a sort of non-utilitarian nature that are sort of removed from self-concerns. And with that, um, researchers have gone out and said, well, how can we find out what these are? And they've gone to concerts um, outside of festivals and just asked people, what did you experience while you were in there? And then you try to see if there are any patterns and what people keep repeating you know, as the emotions they felt. And it, what's interesting is you find emotions like um, nostalgia or tenderness, and you'll have something that's close to happiness, like joyful activation um, has been uh, put forward, for instance. Um, but the idea is that you don't necessarily see the sorts of things we see with um, the basic emotions. Um, in term, another interesting trend, actually, that you see in music psychology research on the topic of induced emotions is that people are now stressing not just what emotions you can have, but how they come about. So the mechanisms underlying them. And indeed, one um, um, influential paper, for instance, suggested there's about eight of them. And um, what I'd like to do is just mention a couple. One of them is, um, one of these me mechanisms is uh, musical expectancy. And this is just the idea that, especially in the case of tonal uh, music, so music that follows these rules, um, you can actually, you tend to make predictions about what's going to happen next. We can't help it, it's also the way our brain is structured. Um, and so of course when you make predictions, sometimes you'll get it right, sometimes you'll get it wrong, sometimes you'll have to wait to find out what the outcome is. And what we've seen is that people generally enjoy this whole sort of predictive process. And what's more, they, um, when you are surprised, when you got it wrong, you, you have a very distinctive um, pattern of brain activity that's kind of cares about you know getting things wrong and um, actually physiological arousal we also see changes in physiological arousal when people get it wrong so we see that actually this is a real mechanism by which you know music emotions are being induced or some sort of emotion is being induced by music another mechanism is um, empathy um, so now um, perhaps most of us think of empathy something as something quite social i empathize with you with someone but it's really a kick to, it's really quite interesting for most people when they find out, who, people who care about um, the, the psychology of aesthetics or music you know, and emotions, et cetera, to find out that actually the word um, empathy came into the Eng uh, English dictionary through the word Einfühlung, which means feel into, and it was all about how we respond to art. And so it's quite interesting to see that empathy is something that actually um, is now recognized as the way we, in which we emotions are induced in us through art and music for example but it was also <laughs> what people were thinking in those days and what's interesting is we've seen studies that show for instance just generally how empathetic you are in everyday life if you're just someone who empathizes a lot you're more you'll this is able to predict the extent to which you'll be moved by sad music for instance so you hear a sad song and you'll say oh gosh I'm so moved and it's because perhaps you're empathizing with what you seem to be think is the story behind that um, similarly, we've seen that if another way, another type of empathy is not sort of very emotional, but rather a bit more cognitive. So it's a weird thing. It's cognitive empathy. And what we've people have shown, for instance, is that um, when you're listening to music that you think has come from a been composed by a real person uh, or compared to when you think it's been composed by an algorithm, uh, a whole brain network that cares about attributing mental states to other people, reading their mind almost lights up, suggesting that again, when we listen to music, we can't help but sort of wonder or reflect on what you know they might be trying to tell us or just mental states that perhaps they were in. Um, the work I do, I guess, is sort of more on the brain side. So I care, I've, I care about how the brain, the brain's emotion network, you know, areas that we know to be involved in processing emotions, um, mediating emotions, how they are um, modulated by um, simple things like consonants and dissonance or the surprise that we feel in response to music. And I do that, I carry out this research sometimes with a very um, unique um, sample of participants, which are um, people who have to have um, intracranial um, electrodes in their brain. So normally we just measure from the scalp, you know, psychology students too often. Um, but sometimes we, we have access to patients who are willing to take part in our experiments who just happen to have electrodes in their brain for surgical procedures that they're about to, you know, carry out. And with that sort of data, we can really get some very fine um, temporal resolution on brain areas that are very, um, that we know, they're very deep in the brain. 
and that we know to be involved in emotion. So that's been sort of some of my research. But in that case, I've tended to use very simple stimuli, the idea being that it's a very uh, rich data set to use a uh, simple stimuli if you can. Um, of course, we want ecological validity. So in other studies, we've brought, um, we've asked people to come into the, um, into the lab with their own music. And then we've asked questions like, bring in music that, you know, there are moments where you find that you find moments really beautiful. And then we've studied how they describe those moments, how they respond physiologically to those moments and actually what's happening in the music in those moments. And we've seen some very interesting patterns in terms of sometimes these moments are very arousing and we see that they, so they, they report them being very arousing. And then we see that in fact their bodily responses reflect that. And we also see in the music that there are clear structural changes at those moments. And then we have others where the they say they report being very calm. And interestingly, we don't see any huge structural changes. If anything, we just see increased smiling, which we think um, has something to do with the fact that actually it's so easy to process and somehow they're seeing the beauty in that ease or sort of processing fluency. And so in those sorts of studies, we're moving away from sort of looking at the fundamentals of features of music to sort of looking at the more emphasis on the experience and trying to understand, um, yeah, basically, yeah, emotions and what we hope is similar to what we are experienced in everyday life.